Thank you, Mitch, and um, welcome everybody to another one of Hype's um, Expert uh, interview series. Uh, you may remember one from a couple of months ago with Liberty Global. Um, we've now moved on to a very different topic, uh, innovation in higher education. And um, yeah, thanks to Bob Newhart and Melanie Robertson for joining us today to talk about their experiences of establishing an innovation program at UC San Diego. Um, I've known Bob and Melanie for some years and worked with them closely, so I'm really excited that they're going to get a chance to tell their story. Uh, they've been at a number of our client forums around the, around the world, also speaking about the work they've been getting involved with. So, um, yeah, delighted to have you, and thank you again for everyone who's, who's joining today. Um, just a bit of context before I ask uh, Bob and Melanie to introduce themselves. I think higher education is a, is a sector which really has a huge need for uh, different solutions and different ways of working uh, to innovate around some real core challenges. There's a, there's a whole range of, of, of wider macro challenges that I think influence this, this sector around funding models, about changing the ways in which we educate people and, and preparing people for, for the future, not just the world that we see today. Um, and Obviously, as, as most of you will know, Hyper are a software company supporting organizations with online innovation programs, and, and that's going to be uh, at least a portion of, of what we're going to talk about today. What I'm also going to hope to do is to take it up a level and talk about the strategic objectives, what the experiences of Bob and Melanie have been, and uh, what sort of outcomes they've been seeing as well in terms of engaging students, staff, and faculty. So let me um, hand over to Bob and Melanie, who are just going to introduce themselves and their role and, and uh, the principles of their program, and then we'll get into some questions. I go first. Okay. Right. I'm Melanie Robertson. Uh, I am the Senior Strategy and Innovation Analyst here in the Operational Strategic Initiatives Department. And uh, I was brought on about 18 months ago to really um, own and manage this program. And uh, I've been doing that now for about 18 months. I'm Bob Newhard, and I lead the Operational Strategic Initiatives area at, on campus. And we're a really broad-based group that uh, touches all of our vice chancellor areas, crossing most of our projects and initiatives cross multiple areas on campus. So it makes us a little bit unique uh, because of that, that that structure and model, which I think we'll touch on a little bit later. And I've been at the university in a number of different roles for just over a decade. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask you a series of, of questions to Bob and Melanie. As, as Mitch said, feel free to, as we're going through, submit your own questions. If possible, I will try to integrate them uh, live on the fly as we go through. However, I may need to leave some to the end. We normally get way more questions than we possibly have time for, so please don't be offended if I, if I don't pick your question out. What we will do is we will come back to you afterwards with, with some responses. Um, obviously. Feel free to ask any questions you like, but we're going to be mainly focused on the questions that relate specifically to this program. But if there are questions that are somewhat off topic, but maybe related, or um, maybe uh, we can come back to you also at a later date. So feel free to also throw those in. Um, I'd like to start off with a question around some maybe the strategy behind this, this program and some founding principles. Um, we tend to think about innovation in, a, in an academic sense around research. Uh, now, uh, Bob, Melanie, you've been establishing a program which has is, is increased the scale of involvement quite dramatically. You've been engaging all the staff, all the faculty, and all the students on the innovation needs of, of, of campus. Maybe you can talk to me a little bit about where did this come from strategically? What was the reason behind establishing an innovation program at such scale and so inclusive? Uh, uh, sure. So, uh, like you mentioned, Colin, innovation has been kind of a, it's a core factor at every university out there and, and UC San Diego has been exceptional at, in their research innovation and we've been very innovative across all of our disciplines but we've changed over the last couple of years, not a couple of years but over the last decades or so there's been a lot of challenges so we've had funding challenges and we've had uh, a number of things that have really kind of pushed us to think a little bit differently and in 2012, late 2012 we had a new chancellor, uh, Pradeep Kosla, uh, join the university and he, in, in, uh, he implemented a comprehensive strategic planning effort for the campus, and it was really our first time we'd done something that included our, our entire health system, our campus, and the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So it's the first time we really had one that we can going to encompass everything, and it was a really inclusive process, 10,000 plus people engaged, but it was manual. And so we had a lot of manual data collection, a lot of uh, qualitative and quantitative data that we collected, but again, it was, it was a very manual process and it took 
a tremendous amount of effort to review and synthesize, uh, find themes, find common areas of interest, find common areas of opportunity that might all lead into the kind of the redevelopment or the creation of our first really comprehensive plan. So that was really an impetus behind what then became a discussion around how do we can keep continue these really tremendous dialogues and conversations that started during the planning process. How do we continue those once we've created what normally is viewed as the, the outcome, which is a, a strategic plan document. So that was one of the, the conversations that our chancellor engaged us in, and we started to look at different methods and approaches that we might be able to scale and engage the campus on all sorts of co conversations and questions that, like we had done during the plan, but with a lot less of a resource impact on our ability to have those conversations and be and have it much more easy for campus to engage with, uh, with, with on those questions and have it uh, scale just at a, at a range that we even couldn't do with a strategic plan because on the strategic plan we did town halls, we did focus groups, we did interviews and we did some surveys. But it, it, they weren't things you could actually create a dialogue, a conversation, kind of move things forward so we really thought that crowdsourcing again would give us an opportunity if we did it well to have a conversation that would build on topics and build uh, answers to our issues or uh, questions that we posed out to campus. So let me just dig into that a little bit. So you talked about um, a need to create a strategic plan, being very inclusive in terms of who you invited to participate in that strategic plan, and then saying, actually, this is good, this is useful if we can be really inclusive. And let's look at, say, online tools and mechanisms to bring people in to then start delivering that strategy. Maybe you can just tell me, at least with some highlights, just briefly, what are the key elements of the strategic plan? What are the key sort of targets and goals that, that UC San Diego has as a, as a result of creating that? Well, you know, we came out with five primary goals from the plan, and and so when you when you look at that, it, we have a student-centered, research-focused, service-oriented, public university. Those are kind of big framing words, but those eight words are the eight words that our chancellor really talks about um, as being the framing aspects of it. And so when you when you look at that, you know, there's a lot of words that go into the descriptions of each one of those goals, and I know those are only sound like four, but they really break into five. Um, but when you look at that plan, and you, we, we wanted to build a program uh, ongoing that would support the key underpinnings of that, and that service-oriented was one of the areas that our team was looked at to really focus on. So, and I think we'll talk about maybe my team a little bit later in, in more detail, but we were really looking at what we call goal five of the plan when we launched, and that is that service-oriented mentality, the ability to service and people oriented. So those are things that would both go to operational efficiency as well as the 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 morale of the staff and improving making sure that it's in a good spot. So that's where our team really focused focused at the beginning and we were really so we really aligned the looking are looking for a platform for something that would help us really engage people around topics that would align to, to that what we call goal five of the plan. Great. Maybe Melanie, you can tell us a little bit more about how uh, an employee, a faculty member, a, 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 a student might experience your, your program on a day-to-day -day basis. Bob mentioned crowdsourcing briefly. Is that the major web method that people will, will, will um, experience as a method of, of participating? Yeah, um, mostly crowdsourcing. Um, they would be able to engage with the tool on a day-to-day -day basis just by going in if they have some sort of idea we do have an open channel available for them um, if their idea doesn't relate to a campaign that's ongoing at that time but um, or if there's no campaign going on at that time so um, you know normally we have the time-bound campaigns but they can engage sort of you know, if they have an idea for a process within their own department or their area of expertise that they're interested in sharing. Great. So maybe let's dig into that a little bit. You mentioned about idea campaigns, crowdsourcing methodology uh, that your team provides. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what other innovation services you provide to the rest of campus. And, um, how does that work in practice? Do people come to you and say, we've got problems, can you help us out? What, what have you got in your sort of toolkit? Or do you look proactively for opportunities to be able to help areas of the organization. How does it work in practice in terms of them accessing your services? So um, 
typically we do get um, people coming to us, they've heard of IdeaWave or they've seen um, results that have come out of it, positive results, and they're interested in learning more about whether or not it will work for them if their uh, question or um, their issue is a good fit for a crowdsourcing campaign. Um, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's more, you know, just educating them that they need to have sort of like a survey that could then inform um, a crowdsourcing effort and a campaign um, and understanding that it's more about building that conversation. Um, so we talk with them, we, we find out, but I would say that I have extremely supportive colleagues in this office that are always looking for those opportunities to bridge the gap between our services. So if you know, someone else on my team is out talking to various clients on campus, they may say, hey, this sounds like a perfect idea campaign that you could run. Um, and so then they'll, they'll kind of forward that on to us and see if, if it'll work for, for them. Great. And Colin, I was going to mention that we also have an organization called, uh, it's this Chancellor's Committee called the, um, we call it SPOC, but it's Service and People Oriented Culture. It's a committee on on that, and that's composed of about 16 faculty members. And they are a listening body that and we help manage and staff that group, and they're a listening body to campus. And they, get, they hear what's going on, and they actually, as they hear different ideas and things that are being talked about, they promote some of those into idea, things that might go into our, our innovation platform as campaigns. And they, in fact, they were the first adopter of the platform for campus. So we had literally, we had 16 faculty that were really driving the initial ideas around mm -hmm. our, our campaign selection. Interesting. So that's a, that's a really helpful picture. So you've got a situation where you have a set of tools, a set of capabilities, um, you have some pretty senior faculty members who are up there, out there saying, well, actually, we want to listen better. We want to source your ideas, your insights, your observations. But also, you're going out there looking for opportunities where you can help the rest of the organization to progress. So that sounds a, sounds a good mix. I think a lot of companies also in the private sector, they struggle with this. Uh, how much should they push these capabilities on the organization, and how much should they wait to uh, allow people to come and find them. And you know, a lot of people who are new to the space, who are perhaps not so comfortable with some of the innovation language, uh, they may not know what these things are, what these capabilities are, and what to use in the right circumstance. You mentioned, Melanie, the difference between a survey and an idea campaign is actually pretty fundamental. But um, both can be used in a complementary way. Um, one of the things that maybe uh, those that are uh, sharp-eyed amongst the audience will have spotted for the uh, higher education event we have coming up in February is that you're also going to be talking about how you serve the continuous improvement world. Um, and I know, Bob, as part of your, your organization, you're not just delivering innovation services, but you're also helping around continuous improvement. Now, a lot of organizations will separate those two worlds out. Now, at UC San Diego, you have them very much as an integrated whole. Maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, that model and, and where you see the advantages of that model. And, um, perhaps some of the, the principles that that, the fun, that uh, uh, inspired you to, to set it up that way. Okay, sure. Uh, when we when we launched both the the concept of going forward with an innovation platform, as well as at the same time uh, we simultaneously launched this, our our Lean Six Sigma capability set as an offering or to campus, for lack of a better word. I don't. I wouldn't. It's not. It's. It didn't start out as an offering purely per campus. It was a capability set we wanted to build for our team internally, and then as we started to do that, and we started to work on projects, we started. To, we had a number of people that said, "Well, where did you do this training? How did you? Wh why? Why did you do this training?" And so we started talking to people about what we did and how we did it, and we found that there was a real desire and interest in people that are in all sorts of areas on campus, but from the health system to um, operations on campus to do always innovate. I mean, it's really, we found that that is really a core underpinning here on our campus. It, it does exist. Everyone wants to innovate, whether, and it doesn't mean new products. It means innovate as it relates to process. Our researchers want to innovate as it relates to their research. Our, 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 med, our people in our hospitals want to innovate as it re re relates to patient care. So it's a really broad range of different areas that they want to innovate in. But we did find that as we went out there using these new tools for our campus, that there was a real desire for that. So we found that as projects and opportunities came in through our platform, uh, for our crowdsourcing platform, in which we call IdeaWave. So if you hear us saying that, um, mm -hmm. it's IdeaWave is our crowdsourcing platform, how we branded it on campus. So as ideas started coming in, there's certain of those projects really 
were very good projects for a Lean Six Sigma type approach to try and solve them. Some of those groups that, they, that those projects related to didn't necessarily have those capabilities set, so we engaged with them to help them gain the, those skills to use it on those projects. So our role isn't to do every project for everybody. It's really to participate and partner with everyone on campus yeah. and make sure that when we're not there, that if, if it was of use, that they've gained new skills and, and new access to different tools and new capabilities as they go. So we, we built off of that. So that Lean Six Sigma capability is something that we've built. We actually have a really good simulation that we do. It's a one-day yellow belt. And last year alone, I think we had over 1,000 people on campus go through the one-day simulation. So it's a, it's a really powerful method that gets people to understand it and then they, they ask for more. We have another group that's organizational performance assessment. So we've mentioned surveys, and they are a, a survey organization that doesn't just do surveys on our campus, but they actually do it for about 12, 13 other campuses, uh, some of them in the UC system, some outside the UC system, uh, doing really complex analytics and finding opportunities at other campuses. And with a group like that as well, they bring opportunities. We see opportunities through them that can be addressed through different methodologies, and some of that being Lean Six Sigma. Right. That's interesting. So essentially what you're doing is you're using this sort of crowdsourcing idea campaign methodology, not just to innovate, but essentially to solve the collaboration problems that exist across around campus, to increase the scale of conversations around a whole range of different organizational needs. I think that's, uh, that, that's really interesting insights. And I'm seeing the same trend emerging in the private sector as well, whereas organizations that were previously just focused on, say, creating a new product are now saying, actually, we can innovate every aspect of our business. And these tools, Yes, they are primarily used for innovation, but they're actually really good collaboration tools, and we can, we can fix all kinds of stuff. So um, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so maybe just a reminder for everybody, if you have any questions as we're going through, please feel free to capture them, and I'll try and integrate them into our discussion. Um, so moving on, uh, we mentioned a couple of times this, this concept of idea campaigns. I think most people who uh, you know on our mailing list at the Hype Hill will, will be familiar with this principle of gathering larger groups of people around a topic and a need over a relatively short period of time and doing that online so that we can uh, increase the scale. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what types of topics you've been addressing. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the, the types of campaigns that um, you've, been, uh, you've, been, you've been addressing, what kind of need, what kind of problems have you been trying to solve? Yeah, uh, we've had uh, tremendous success with um, strategic planning campaigns, actually. Uh, recently, we've, you know, we've actually, over the last year, um, been approached to run um, four or five different strategic planning campaigns. Uh, by various departments, um, one of which is ongoing right now, and it's for the entire campus. It's for our equity, diversity, and inclusion group. Uh, so really building the strategic plan for the entire campus to um, become a space for inclusive excellence. Uh, and then we've also had um, campaigns that focus more on testing. So we had uh, an onboarding, so an, a hiring uh project that had already been established and uh, that one already had the scope set and they were just you know putting this campaign out there to test kind of whether that scope really matched with what the project team assumed they were going to deliver and um, that was a, again it, they run the full spectrum but we've also had been approached for a discovery campaign um, that one is kind of discovering maybe why we might be launching um, IT defects that are extremely costly. So they're going to put that out to an expert group and um, find out more information from them on why that might be occurring. And then we've had like some creative campaigns um, that came up with ideas on how to streamline and standardize the staff performance appraisal process. Uh, that one ended up turning into a full-blown project as well. Great. And maybe uh, you can tell us about some of the outcomes. What results have you seen? Uh, with the strategic planning campaigns, uh, in particular, uh, most what's really interesting about those is that the, um, the at least in the Department of Pharmacy, they had over 300 very busy pharmacists and pharmacist technicians that just they can't get them in a room. They they have to have some sort of online tool to um, get their 
to get them to contribute to the strategic plan. They ended up um, implementing or at least including um, almost all, if not all or partial of some of the ideas that were submitted into the end strategic plan. Um, I'm going to add one thing along yeah. with that one. At the same time, the pharmacy group decided to have a number of people engage in Lean Six Sigma training. So then some, a number of their people then took some of those projects and implemented those, and some of those projects are saving millions of dollars a, a year. So yeah. do you want to add that into that? that that's a group Thank that actually so. took both sides of the equation, of, 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 well, two sides of our equation that we offer, and went with both of them and implemented, and they've been really successful. Uh, and then the onboarding project that I mentioned, they actually changed their the scope of their project. So it ended up being, you know, just a good verification that what they were actually delivering for campus was going to solve the problems that they were actually trying to solve. Right. Uh, so that was another great outcome. Yeah, I love that uh, the concept of a sort of testing or validation campaign where we already have some kind of idea about what we want to do, but we want to check that it is going to fit and everyone's going to be happy with it. I imagine that smooths the adoption of that change in process quite quite dramatically by being more inclusive. Uh, that's a really good, good piece of advice, I think, for anybody who's going down this path is to actually use those, those, those kind of techniques, not just to be creative, but also to test and validate what you're already working on. Um, maybe I can just ask, I mean, given that this is the way in which people have been experiencing um, how to get involved in innovation at UC San Diego. Have you any feedback from, you've got three really different groups. So you've got, you've got staff, you've got faculty and students who are incredibly different in terms of their nature, their, their goals, the way in which they work. Um, I'm just interested if you have any sort of even anecdotal feedback from those groups and how you compare and contrast uh, the experiences of those three. Yeah, I, I would say that um, staff are probably the most engaged and the most interested in the crowdsourcing tool. We see the most participation, but we also see uh, a lot of positive feedback about the tool um, coming from uh, the various campaign managers or those that participate within the campaigns. Um, when it comes to students, I would say that they're still kind of trying to get that awareness out there with them, um, trying to get in front of them, get their attention can be a little bit of a challenge sometimes, but you know, the more that we can actually run those campaigns with them, we can build that awareness and we can get that positive feedback from them that when they actually see results occurring. Yeah, and, and I had a couple of examples that I've heard of. We had the chair of one of our largest departments uh, send an email and he sent it to all the faculty in his department saying that idea wave and the concept that we have behind it and how we're using that to bring you know both uh, difficult issues to, to a point of conversation and discussion as well as just any topic that's in there is one of the most he actually said that it's the most impactful and beneficial thing that came out of the strategic plan so that was a really a powerful statement then you know, I've had different conversations with some of our business officers around campus and in our early campaign, we had some certain things that were implemented. Uh, our campaign to reduce administrative burden, which was fondly referred to as CRAB on campus, um, that campaign had a number of, of things that were imp implemented during the first three weeks of while it was open. And so I had a conversation with some of the business officers around, around some of those. And I said, well, I heard that some of those things had been talked about in the past. They weren't necessarily brand new ideas. And they said, look, those were ideas that have been brought up years ago and in a, lot, a number of times, but no one ever took action on them. It was the first time that they were brought up. The conversation led to direct action, and it was taken, you know, and this action took place within, you know, two weeks. So it was yeah. an interesting conversation that maybe things had been heard before, but they hadn't been heard in a way that action was actually taken. Yeah. <coughs> that's, that's great, great feedback. Um, I got a, our first question actually has come in, um, and I'm going to sort of dig into this now. I think it, it makes sense um, because we talk about this principle of, of idea campaigns being as a way of, of increasing uh, sharing and collaboration, and it, those two things are different in terms of people sharing what they have and also working with each other. We have a question here about: Are you able to share any sort of concrete examples about how you've seen collaboration increased using this technique, and any any elements that you have uh, put in place to help? facilitate that increase in collaboration? I mean, I can touch on a, on, a, on a few things out there. One, I mean, the 
collaboration, for the examples that Melanie gave around strategic planning in it for these departments, it was a way that the, when you talk about 300 pharmacists and, la and pharmacy techs never having a chance to have those conversations, they just don't have it. They are all over the hospitals. They never have a chance yeah. to actually get together. It was one of the few times, and they were they were so excited about having this chance to interact, to talk, yeah. to yeah. have their ideas out there and build on each other's ideas. So that I mean that's one very tangible example right. that, that we saw. Uh, and we, we're seeing it. Uh, we're talking about how we're using it on our research side. There's different ways on that that uh, we haven't rolled out yet, but it's one of the use cases that we'll maybe talk about uh, that we're, which it's definitely focused on collaboration, but it's industry collaboration with our researchers through mm -hmm. the platform. Mm -hmm. And we have a, another one we're working on right now with our, our hospital system for the, it's, it's, we had this program called Leading the Way where we brought thousands of people together to bring, bring their ideas together. But then it stopped. It was all manual, kind of like our strategic plan. And now we're building the continuation of those dialogues that happen right. through the platform, mm -hmm. through the tool moving forward. Uh, so we have a, I'd say there's a lot of examples of how collaboration and discussions have continued. We've got a, a couple of researchers that are looking at it on ways to um, build on one of the research projects, but I don't know, think I can actually mention what it is yet. And then there's another uh, faculty member that was using it to build a whole new uh, area in their fac in, uh, in biology to kind of explore building out uh, a new program in biology with other faculty members, and we've had the Academic Senate look at it, it built, uh, we might have a whole other college on our campus and the Academic Senate used it to start to collaborate around ideas and review documents that were already being passed around and have discussions on those. So I think that there's quite a few examples and so, Melanie might have more. So many examples um, that I can think of that it, it's, you know, they're collaborating, there's knowledge sharing within it, I mean, but it really requires people to be active within the tool and for lots of uh, very diverse groups to be active within the tool to then get in there and say, oh, this really is a problem and I can help with this or maybe together we can work together to solve this problem. Um, even with the parking campaign, I mean, a lot of insights came in, but it wasn't always within the parking department's um, purview or resources to be able to fix those problems. So maybe they had to reach out um, to other various departments to see if they could work with them on um, solving some of the, the things that were definitely important to campus and um, that they wanted to fix. Maybe let's dig into that because I know that that was a campaign that you, you included students with. And I think that that's anyone in higher ed is going to be sort of thinking carefully about, do we include students yeah. and to what extent? Um, you know, <laughs> I'm wondering how nervous were you? You know, we all, we all see social media, we know how the masses can be, and you've got a, a big group of students. Um, tell me a little bit about engaging students and whether you saw the same types of behaviors as you did with faculty and staff, and, and what was that experience like of engaging such a large group of people, what is it, like 30,000 or so students on a single campaign? Do you want to talk about how it was it? So we were very at the very beginning. We were we were very cautious. Uh, we were we weren't sure. You know, we just weren't sure how it would go. We'd had other interactions where um, you know, our students are very vocal, very smart, very um, have very strong opinions, and that's great. That's why we. That's why we're here, right? We're here to. That, that's what energizes us. So. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we created a, a place to really kind of have constructive dialogue going forward. So one of the things we did is we have something called the principles of community on our campus. And we actually, in order to actually put any comments in here, when you log in, every single time you log in, you have to accept the principles of community. And they're about how we want to work together, respect each other, treat each other, those type of things. So, uh, so we use those as our terms and conditions for anybody using our platform. Uh, obviously, if we're using some industry collaboration, we have some other terms for that. But um, at a baseline for everyone in our campus community, that's how they have to they have to sign up to that. Right. So that was one thing. We had um, with the platform there were different um, uh, things you can set in there that'll tr flag different words or different types of things. But we can never keep up with the speed at which uh, new words are generated that we may not may not understand, you know, uh, what the real meaning is with the uh, street lingo versus our more traditional way of using 
flagging word. <laughs> so we were trying to. Uh, so we did have people monitoring early programs quite a bit, and we had really no issues in our early programs. We had the the only person that had been flagged actually had flagged themselves because they didn't like the way they had written something and they didn't know how to edit it. So they flagged their own comment or their own idea and took it down and then talked to us about how to edit it and edit it and then it went back up. That was in the early campaigns, that was really what we saw. And then we you know we, we have some more that are very sensitive right now going on and we've had a little bit more on things that are on the edge right now, but um, we're Keep an eye on it. Well, I was going to say the for the most part, all of the fears and concerns about student participation and the inappropriateness that might come out, uh, I would say have not have not it's it doesn't exist. Um, however, because of the sensitive topic that we are exploring right now with um, our EBI campaign, um, you know. Honestly, and for the sake of honesty, we have had our first ever um, inappropriate use of the tool. Uh, and, um, and basically, I think that it might just be because there might be some confusion about the purpose of the tool, that it's an idea generation tool, that it's a collaboration tool, and it's not necessarily just a social media space for ranting. So um, I mean, that's just, but that's an education piece. Um, you know, and just needs to be addressed. And it's one in 18 months I've been here and three years of the tool being active. Not too bad. It's not too bad. So that's interesting. So it sounds like a combination of factors are helpful in terms of at least making yourselves feel more comfortable. Part of it is setting some clear terms. Part of it is around educating people around the purpose and what you're trying to achieve here, but also keeping an eye on some moderation just in case uh, something is, is submitted that uh, isn't quite in line with what uh, your values are. Um, I'm kind of interested in, in this kind of concept of, of level of openness and inclusivity, and this also relates to a question that we, we have uh, right now. Um, it seems that you control your audiences, so you're not necessarily opening everything to everybody. Um, some topics are very focused, maybe a modest price group, and some are very open. Um, maybe this is around subject sensitivity. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about, about that and, and, and how you make your choices. Do you... Um, do you target your audiences specifically? Do you try and be open by default unless you need to be restricted? Maybe you can tell us a little bit more. Well, I'll, I'll start how we started, and then okay. Melanie can talk a little bit more too. But uh, when we first looked at it, the, the, I, the most of the campaigns that get generated out of our group or that were ideas that came from the Standing Committee on Service and People or in the culture, the, the 16 faculty members, are all inclusive. I mean, they really traditionally are larger, and in the framing of that, we weren't looking to parse the, to a smaller group. It would be all, the first campaign we did was all faculty, staff, and any students that were employees. I mean, so that was 35,000 people out the door. So that was a large one at the very beginning. Um, then, after, you know, what, what's really happened for our smaller groups is when people that have been engaged in it, that have had success and, and seen what have come out of it, at a macro one, most of them have seen that and come back and said, I'd like to do something specifically between my group and these people I serve so I can actually serve them better. Right. So it's been mainly the people that are asking to do a smaller engagement are users of the platform on a macro scale that have said, oh, I could use this in another way in another series of questions with a different group of people. Is that yeah, yeah, they typically identify who they're on. The, the campaign managers or the clients that come to us typically identify who their audience, who their target audience is going to be. Obviously, if the Department of Pharmacy wants to do a strategic plan, they're going to put it to, you know, their group, their department. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. may invite other people in, but that, you know, they're going to start with their internal folks and make sure they touch every single one, give them a chance to have a have a voice. And then they might, again, they might then do a, a sounding session using the platform out to other people sure. to provide feedback on it, which is some of what how EDI is handling yeah. some of theirs. They're doing they're they're multi phase one, just like some of the other ones have done multi phase, where they do one group, kind of to get started, to get some ideas formed, and then they'll then shape those, synthesize those into something, and then and then test that out with other people and other groups, and then keep yeah. broadening out the feedback. So it's, it sounds like so one campaign is leading to another campaign leading to another. So you've, you've got a sort of a set of activities. So that you know, collaborating here is leading to more collaboration later. I wondered if also you've noticed people 
collaborating offline as a result of coming to know each other online? Is that something you've spotted of uh, new groups emerging, or maybe it's not something that's possible for you guys to see, but I'm just interested to see whether that is helping, you know, sort of stimulate more connections across campus? Well, it's, I hope so. It, 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 well, we actually have a couple of different groups that have formed network groups. So, okay. uh, one, you, uh, one, we have the the, the wave runners, the wave runners yes. that are the power users of the platform, and they actually meet and talk, and we help facilitate those sessions. And then we have ones that are related to. Pro, I mean, we have we basically have like maybe two times a year now where people get together that are either that are part of this innovation network. And there are people that are innovating through using tools, technology. I mean, it, we don't limit it just to people that are using the platform per se, but we, we bring all the interested groups that we're aware of, maybe the Lean Six Sigma groups and the, the people that are really into IdeaWave, and we bring them all together. There's poster sessions. There's other discussions. So there's, there's a lot that goes on um, in that, and there's a tremendous lot of discussion that's going on from those that continue on across campus. Um, we've seen, I mean, we don't track it per se, except for the events that we are that we go to and, you know, 200 people show up to network and go to a poster session about how they're innovating on operations or how they're doing, how they're using the platform or how they're doing Lean Six Sigma and how that links back to, and every single time though, if you have a long enough conversation, you see the thread back to different, and there's a connection between either an idea campaign to this, to this, to this, or from the, uh, one project that someone worked on, you can see a connection to another project that maybe sparked the idea in another group to go and do it. Uh, so that we, it's, it, it's, it is really powerful once you begin this process. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Really great to hear. Um, we have another great question. I think it's really uh, ties into some of the things I think we wanted to talk about around future use cases as well. You know, we talked about engaging with campus, you know, the UC San Diego family. What about beyond the UC San Diego organization. Have you engaged with other universities, uh, startups, corporates? Uh, what, what's your experience is that? Uh, well, I actually wanted, when I first started, I wanted to test the um, external capabilities so of the tool. I wanted to see what it would be like to run a campaign with a group um, from the uh, Network for Continuous uh, Innovation, I think, NCCI. And um, so we ran a campaign for them uh, initially just to see, okay, what kind of ways could they um, improve their professional development within their, um, they have like an annual conference. So we've run that one. Um, and then we also did a campaign uh, with the, um, with a bunch of different uh, universities, private sector, uh, two-year, uh, colleges uh, across the nation and it was in an attempt to um, the NSF had funded a conference on uh, collective impact as a pathway to reinvigorate uh, participation in STEM programs and so uh, that one was really interesting because we invited about 200 participants from across the country and asked them okay what kind of topics, what do you want to learn about when it comes to collective impacts over, you know, over the course of the three-day conference while you're here. Um, about 60% of them participated, so once they actually came to the conference, they were familiar with the tool, and then they got to actually get in the tool and use it while they were at the conference. Great. Those are some hard, concrete examples. Yeah. And are there other, other communities outside of the organization you're looking to engage in the future? Uh, we are looking at, well, I think our health system in general is looking at a number of different ways. They're looking at engaging actually patients into conversations about how we can improve our, the patient experience. Uh, we've got, uh, we have a research collaboration model that we're working on right now that would, it, it would bring research collaborators, so and industry people into the equation to look at early stage discoveries that are going on on our campus to see if they believe there's any use in their areas, and they be and so there's a lot so there's a lot of a, a lot of work background work that's been done around that one. Uh, we haven't launched it, but it, there's work on that one, and that's primarily where we've done industry related things. We've we've talked to a couple of companies that are interested in potentially doing a campaign out to our undergraduates to understand uh, what they feel about different 
you know, maybe new products, new services, and which could be a pretty interesting uh, approach to getting feedback and ideas around offerings. We haven't done that yet, but there's definitely the potential of mm -hmm. having engagement of our of our students. Our students are very innovative. Uh, there's been a few companies have talked about well, maybe they'd want to help problem solve with us. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that's something also that uh, we're we're talking about just mm -hmm. right now. Do you see any differences in terms of um, engaging those external groups versus engaging UC San Diego kind of family, people more used to Idea Wave? Have you had any sort of big observations in terms of, or do people tend to participate pretty much the same way? I wouldn't say I notice anything noticeable. I, I think people participate, yeah, similarly. Mm -hmm. It depends, I mean, it's the topic, it's the goal of the campaign. So as long as it's relevant, people and they're interested, they're going to participate. Right. I think that's really is that that relevancy and their interest, you know, that really drives the participation. I, I, the NSF grant one that Melanie noted earlier, I think, is a really good example because those people were going to come to this conference. They could have just done it like any other conference where they just right. attended, but uh, they were highly engaged coming into it using a platform like this. So when they got here, they were already thinking about the key topics they wanted to engage in the conversations. They were they were coming well prepared for really in depth conversations on on meaningful topics, and we didn't have to do any training. We didn't. I mean, it was really. And the one thing I have to say is that this been really when we engage external entities, we're not doing any special training. We're not. We we basically frame up the campaign and invite them in, and they go in and they it's self explanatory when they're in there about what we're what the expectations are, um, what we're looking for. We get very few questions. I, I mean, Melanie, you've no, done more really. better than I. Yeah. yeah, people tend to be able to understand it pretty easily. Well, that's that's that's, that's good to hear, and it's interesting that you don't see vast differences. Uh, what I'm picking up on is you know, frame your question well, focus it appropriate to your audience, and then you should see a relatively consistent experience of people sharing and collaborating. Yeah. Um, we well, have another question which is kind of related to this, which is you know you've got a large group of people, potentially quite high levels of engagement at certain campaigns. Um, you know, one of the methods, of course, of, of, of maintaining momentum is to moderate. Uh, I have a question here: Is how do we ma how do you manage those dialogues between such complex and large groups where there's different perspectives, different you know, tensions, maybe different uh, different viewpoints? Do you moderate? Do you keep an eye on the discussion? And so, how does that how does that come across? We keep an eye on the ideas. Uh, it's me and then the campaign management team. So whatever um, client group that I'm working with, I will sort of set out for them before we start what we could potentially see and what the responsibilities will be of two to three individuals that should probably be in there once a day just looking around, making sure that they're following the campaign, that they're reading the, the um, ideas that are coming in and the comments, um, but also they should be um, participating. They should be helping to um, engage the group. So if an idea comes in but it's not fully developed, maybe they should be the ones that are actually asking questions um, within the tool and commenting to make sure that they can help build that idea out further. Um, I wouldn't say, I mean, that's that's what I would consider moderation, just to make sure that we're getting the best quality product um, out of out of the time-bound campaign, because we only have a, so much time before it ends. Yeah, we don't, we don't do the traditional moderator function. We haven't felt the need for it. We've seen fairly good constructive dialogue because of the way we frame things. And then where we feel like there's more behind someone's statement, we may go in and say, um, do you have other examples? We might, we might just, we won't, we, we never try and value or disvalue, but we may try and pull more out. We, or we might ask someone to say, do you, you know, is there anyone else that might have an opinion on this? You know, so we can, so we have these very broad frame questions that we might do to kind of help pull more out if we feel like it might be there. But we, uh, we, we don't do traditional moderation or, or delay the response. They, they are. We, they, when someone clicks submit, it goes out. It goes out, and it might go out to the wrong place, too. So, I mean, in terms of typical moderation, you know, just making sure things are in the right place. Um, sometimes they get submitted to the wrong campaign. So that would right. be... Yeah. So, phrase your campaign questions correctly, 
try and choose your audience appropriately, keep an eye on it, and then you can move or give feedback and bring in something if you need to. I think that's uh, sage advice. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can just build on that a little bit in terms of learnings. I mean, you've been doing this for a couple of years now. Um, maybe, I think for anyone who's looking at this fresh, they're always interested in what bear traps did you step in that they can perhaps avoid. Are there any sort of key learnings that you could share, you know, maybe three observations of things that you might say, you know what, if we'd had our time again, maybe we wouldn't have done that, we would have done that another way. Um, what do you look at with, in hindsight and think maybe we could have done it a little differently? Um, I would have loved to have been here from the beginning. Uh, it's a little hard to come in, uh, you know, halfway through, um, late in the game, I guess, and there's a lot of history, there's a lot of historical knowledge, um, because as you're ramping up, you know, there's just, there's a lot that happens in the beginning. So, I mean, I wish I had been here from the beginning to kind of see, um, the birth of this program and um, been able to kind of learn it from the from the early, early stages. But thankfully, I have a great team that keeps me informed <laughs> all the time of how it went. Um, and then also, um, there's a lot of ideas that are in the archives right now that come up again and again through, um, through the various campaigns that are run over the years. And they'll say, OK, you know, I already submitted this idea to a previous campaign. Now are you going to listen to my idea? And I, and I kind of wish that there had been um, in the beginning sort of a plan for the curation of those types of ideas. Mm -hmm. um, that would have been something that, um, that I would have done, you know, from the outset. Yeah. And for me, I think uh, just, you know, this is a big change management type of concept that you always have to be aware of when you're rolling out a new platform like this, not just on how you use it, but this really shifts the hierarchical play that, that exists in many organizations where this gives a voice to every single person. And we paid attention to it, but we didn't really put a lot of thought into it up front. Like when a manager may have said, I don't want to go do this, but someone in the organization submits an idea in an idea campaign that is then all of a sudden becomes a hot idea and, and everyone's joining in on it. It, it, changed, it causes some dynamic. So really, Having put a little bit more thought into some of those aspects would have probably been good. We 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 uh, we do have a change management methodology and approach that we follow, uh, and that does help us. And it we've used it throughout this process rolling this out. But some of those type of nuances we kind of learned or thought about more on the fly. So that was something that we uh, uh, we've been successful in getting awareness and desire and engagement. But uh, we definitely have. Uh, a few of those nuances that have popped up throughout mm -hmm. the time that we would have been really useful. I don't know if we would have done something different per se, but we would have been maybe more aware of this group's prob we, we pretty much knew which groups probably would get the most ideas related to them submitted, and but it wouldn't have stopped us from actually doing yeah. the campaign. We may have just managed those groups a little bit differently. Okay. So, you know, I think the lessons here are treat it like a change management project. You know, crawl, walk, run, maybe, <laughs> in terms of rolling this out. That makes sense. And I, I really like this ob observation around curation, plan for curation from the start, because, you know, certainly from my perspective of witnessing many of these programs, over time you build up a really large repository of content. And, and some of that content is good, really good, but you just can't do it then. And having some to be managing that content for a future reference, and when the time is right, we can go back to that archive and say, actually, now we, let's, put, let's, let's investigate this a little bit more. I think it's a lot of makes a lot of sense, and I think a lot of organisations sort of struggle with that. So I think that's really again sage advice. So um, as we come towards the end of our time, I've got one last question for you. Um, and feel free if there's anybody who has any final questions to please submit them. We've had some great questions so far. Um, you know, it occurs to me that a big part of the success of this program is really connected to the fact you started off. We tying this into a strategic plan. Um, that was this kind of the, the direction on day one. And I, I wonder how many groups like yours that have your remat of innovation and continuous improvement um, actually really exist in, in other higher education establishments. Do you think having a structure like yours is a prerequisite to, to establishing a program like this? Do you think it's vital to have it tied in to the strategic plan on day one? What's your observations in terms of and maybe some advice for others who maybe don't have the same uh, structures that you have or maybe the same leadership support that you have in terms of getting something like this off the ground? Do you think it's possible? Uh, definitely it's possible. I, I mean, this isn't 
one size fits all by any sense of, of interpretation of it. We came out from a certain spot where there's strengths, you know, starting out with a, you know, a chancellor endorsed type of solution, but there's also negatives. It feels like a top down sometimes. So, you know, we, you have to really play with each one of those. There's an opportunity in any area, as long as the person sponsoring it, in my mind, um, has the authority to take action on ideas that come out of it. So if you started in, let's just say, procurement and contracts, and you had a, the, a platform like this, and you said, I want to improve the procurement, the procure-to-pay cycle on our campus, and you have the authority to take action, it's a perfect platform, a perfect, perfect methodology to go and do that. As long as the person sits you know, at the top of the, that program level that they can take action, I think you, you'll, you'll be successful. You may not immediately be all the way across your entire entity, but that's, I don't think anyone wants to be across all their entire entity on day one with something like this, really. We did, but it's, it's a lot, you know, it's a lot to handle. So I, 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 from my perspective, the, the, and you can be successful at any level as long as that you have the right endorsers both for the campaign and for taking action. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I get this asked this question whenever I um, have talked about our program with other universities. They say, well, what if my president or my chancellor doesn't buy in from day one? And, um, you know, this isn't, you know, we're not just like a template that you can plug and play, but I mean, as long as you, I would say that as long as you have a strong influencer or a strong um, leader that's interested in um, sort of sharing that message and then delivering like solid results, it's it's going to catch. Um, you know, it, it takes time. It takes years um, sometimes for the awareness to build it, and it depends on the size of the organization too. Right. Well, fantastic. We're coming to the end of our time now, so I just want to sort of summarize a few takeaways that, that I've, I've seen uh, and, and heard from you over the last hour or so. Um, I think that the first one is that uh, it's a great way of being inclusive. Um, it's very helpful in terms of engaging people around, around the organization on the things that are important to you. Uh, I think it's a really good observation you made earlier on, Bob, around, you know, this is this is this can be applied to operational considerations, it can be applied to innovation considerations, it can support the morale of staff in terms of being more involved and more supportive. And I, I really like that idea of, of testing and validating new initiatives before they're rolled out. I think that's a great way of, of supporting that, uh, that that change in mindset perhaps. Um, I think you talked a lot about how really this is a collaboration process and we can really point it at a whole range of different things. And what was interesting is that this is seeming to stimulate more collaboration across campus by stimulating with a campaign and then seeing online, offline activities of groups continuing to talk to each other and, and network and, and talk perhaps when they didn't even, weren't even aware of each other's existence before, which I think is, again, a, a really great sign in terms of being more inclusive and driving towards better outcomes. I think your observations on involving students were fascinating, how that they, you know, by and large, you haven't seen any uh, counterproductive uh, insights or observations from them, uh, probably just one, uh, but I think that over 18 months, two years is, is really a pretty good ratio. So it's interesting that they're responding in pretty much the same way as your engagement with other universities around the US or staff and faculty there at UC San Diego, that everyone are experiencing this in pretty much a, a similar way. So um, fantastic to, to talk with you and spend some time about these topics, let's talk through these topics. Uh, for those of you to ask questions, thank you so much. There were some really great uh, questions in there. For those of you we didn't get time to uh, respond to, we will come back to you on your questions. We never have time to respond to everybody's, I'm afraid. But this has been really interesting from my perspective. Thank you again to, to Melanie and Bob for sharing their, their insights and over to, to Mitch to, uh, to close us out. All right, thanks you, uh, for your time, everybody. I hope you found some inspirations and practical tips to take home. And of course, as I said in the beginning, we'll send around a follow-up email containing the link to the recording, so you have the opportunity to watch it again or share it with your colleagues. And of course, we'll send you also an invitation to the Innovation in Higher Ed Day at uh, the UCSD in February. And then one just, just one minor thing. Um, after the webinar, there will be a short survey. It just takes two minutes, not more. Uh, with feedback questions. Please do take those two minutes and provide us with your feedback to, uh, to become better at this. Uh, thanks for your time and hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.